Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we are going to be continuing, but before that, I want you to applause our very, very beautiful ladies who are our guests today. So, Okay, so we have very beautiful guests here, our football teams. I'm going to ask, uh, announce them for you for who's going to be joining us right now. Mini Qz Antalya Spor Kulübü futbol takım oyuncularına bir alkış rica edelim. Antalya Deniz Spor Kadın Futbol Takımı, onlara da bir alkış rica edelim. Sizleri burada aramızda görmekten çok memnunuz. Sıradaki panelimize direkt hemen başlayalım isterseniz. Our next panel is going to be about the secrets of the football recruitment. Here are our guests are... Mr. Laurent Deschaux, Chief Scout of Ammonia, please welcome. Marcelo Salazar, Football Executive Director of El Nasser. Jehun Kazancı, former Beşiktaş Sports Director. Nicola Inocentin, former sports director of El Fateh. <gülüyor> And our moderator <gülüyor> is... Terkan Bil, thank you. Okay. Sen burada mısın? Yeah. Okay, so our moderator <gülüyor> is Tarkan Batgün from Compressinator. Going to moderating. No problem. Before I go, I want like I would like to in, uh, introduce you or young football players that they are coming. Bin 200 Antalya Spor Kulübü A takım futbolcuları ve Antalya Deniz Spor Kulübü futbolcuları bugün bizimle beraberler. The stage is yours. Welcome everybody, and um, it's been fantastic uh, to see you guys, four aces from around the world, I should say. And uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome uh, 1207 Antalya women's team and Antalya Denispor uh, women's team. Welcome again. Well, uh, Nico, Jayon, Laurent, Marcelo, all experts in player recruitment. I mean, we're going to be talking about the secrets, but there are some qualities in each of you everyone knows, so it's not really a secret. So, let me just introduce you all. First, Nicola Inocentin, my dear friend for more than 10 years, and uh, you would all remember him bringing uh, Roberto Mancini to uh, Galatasaray. Jeyun Kazanji, former uh, Besiktas uh, sports director, but he has been in the football industry for, God knows, more than 17, 20, 17 years. Yeah, 17 years. And Laurent Dachau comes from um, French background, but from all around the world, from Nottingham Forest to now being a chief scout of Omonia. And... Um, Mr. Marcelo Salazar, originally from Brazil, and now uh, he is the team executive of El Nasser. And uh, what I'd like to do is to 
learn your secrets first, uh, Jehun, with regard to player equipment, because you made a lot of teams, but you also had a background in agency far yeah, back in time, time ago, a long yeah. time ago. I used to be an agent. So you've been in both sides of the buying and selling yeah. business. So please let us know about your experience sure. in the last 17 years. Yeah, sure, yeah. 17 years ago, actually, I entered to this sector as an agent, as a football agent. And of course, it helped me a lot during my duty as a sporting director. Because knowing everything actually in the, in the sector is really helping a lot. Networking is the most important thing, definitely. But while working in a club, also knowing the identity of the club is very, very crucial, I guess. Because as you can imagine, every single country, every single sector has some own challenges. For example, in Turkey, the biggest challenge is the budget, budget management. Because when I started to work in Beşiktaş in 2021, one euro was equal to 10 Turkish lira. And when I left in 2023, it was 33. So one euro was equal to 33. Obviously, you need to pay to the foreign players in euro. So they wouldn't accept Turkish lira because there is no stability. So this is the biggest challenge. But definitely, if you work in Europe, this is not a uh, problem for you. At least you know your budget. But uh, to be honest, when you decide about, about a budget at the beginning of the season, it's never the same at the end of the season. That's the biggest challenge for Turkish clubs, for Turkish sporting directors. Secondly, definitely you need to have a harmony with the, with the coach. First of all, you need to identify the needs of the club. Mm. Afterwards, according to your budget, you need to focus on the, uh, on the players that you need, on the positions that you need. And we, for sure, we use some softwares to identify the, the correct uh, players to put in the team. And uh, afterwards, you need to start to negotiate everything. And, uh, but before, for Turkish markets, as you can imagine, as my colleagues know very well, uh, mostly before we were always uh, trying to sign some experienced and old players, but very, very well known in Turkish markets, uh, in front of the fans actually, in the eyes of the fans. So I think this is one of the biggest mistakes uh, in Turkish markets, because, okay, you might be the, the last stop of that player, and you never know how ambitious he is. So he comes here, 33, 34 years old, definitely a big name, but you never know the outcome. While signing the player, everything is okay, everything is fine. You are the hero as sporting director. But at the end of the story, most of the times it's not the same. So what I try to do uh, as Beşiktaş sporting director, I always try to sign uh, some assets. Because, as I said, Budget management is the biggest problem. And in order to run the club in a proper way, you need to develop some players. Okay, some players from youth academy, but while signing the players, you, have, you also have to have a plan uh, sell them in two, three years and to make some money. Unfortunately, this is not priority for Turkish club. And uh, for short time, as I said, for a sporting director, this is not a big problem. But in two, three years, you see that this is a huge problem for Turkish clubs. Yesterday, I'm not sure if you saw, FIFA made seven a declaration. Clubs. Seven clubs in Turkey, they will have restrictions. Transfer ban. Yeah, they are banned now for three transfer window. This is not acceptable. So they made this decision for 21 clubs, and seven of them out of 21 are from Turkey. Doesn't make any sense. So somebody should stop this. As I said, as a sporting director, that was my aim. But it's not easy because in Beşiktaş you have 25 million fans. They don't care. They and you always care. need to buy the best. For sure, and yeah. they're going to play today and score tomorrow. You need to make them happy. Exactly. There is no patience. You need to make them happy while signing the player, during the process, and while selling the player. It's always very cheap when you sell a player. If you sell for 5 million, they are not happy. <coughs> they want 10. They want 15 million. But while signing a player, if do you sign a player for 3 million, it's very expensive. So 
and you, they need some big names at the same time. So you need to find the balance as a sport. Also, director. bringing the player is another case. Definitely. Because so, uh, they're going to <laughs> European clubs in a half price when they either want to come to Turkey or they want to come to Saudi, even to Cyprus. That's normal. They yeah. uh, ask astronomical, astronomical numbers. Our advantage is when we mention a number for salary uh, to a player, it's always net. But when you mention a number in Europe, it's always gross and they will pay, of course, depending to, to the country, it's maybe 45%, sometimes 50% tax they need to pay. But in Turkey, if we pay 1 million to a player, it's 1 million. It will come to his pocket. So that's our advantage. But they always have some questions about the question marks in their minds about the regular payments, because we are very famous about uh, paying late. And uh, most of the times they need to go to court, etc. They don't want to bother themselves with those problems. But as Besiktas, we always paid on time, uh, because we knew our budget very well. We knew how much we can pay. But while convincing the player, definitely these are the questions coming from them. As I said, you need, as a sporting director, you need to find the balance. You need to make, you cannot, of course, make everyone happy. But at least you need to find the balance. And at the end of the day, if you win, you are successful. If you don't win, you cannot stay. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a very, very stable sector, actually. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jeyun. Uh, now uh, I will bring the ball to Nicola Innocentin. Nico also is to come from both sides. But now um, the interesting thing that I've taken a note, the FIFA Diploma Club Management course, which is the highest level, I guess, education. Um, and... Nico is always remembered with Roberto Mancini to Frank Ribery to many different places, but also uh, in El Fate, it's a completely different environment. Um, bringing, finding free players almost immediately and making an impact in Saudi was something quite remarkable. And now I will pass the ball to you. Thank you, Tarkan. Uh, I totally agree with the analysis that Cheyun just made. Uh, first of all, you need to understand uh, in which uh, uh, club you are working, you know, uh, in which environment you are working. Because, for example, me and Marcelo, we, I was working, still working in Saudi Arabia, uh, same league, but two different uh, clubs. Okay? Worlds, actually. <clears throat> yes. So I think that uh, later on in my head, something to what I'm saying now, you need to understand uh, immediately, you know, where you are, uh, which are the goals of your, of your team, because according to that, you make your plan, okay? So, in Alfate, for example, I had uh, a limited budget, but I knew that uh, still I couldn't bring a player that, for example, I, I, I knew from the past, and maybe they were not that well known, but they could have got a strong impact to the league. Because also bringing Slav and Bilic uh, also yes, yes. is a, yes, that's a part actually, of the whole plan. That was actually the beginning, but not every time uh, a sporting director has the possibility to, 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 to choose the involved. coach or yeah. to bring the coach because maybe um, uh, you work in a club there. that the co coach was already there. So in this case, I was uh, lucky, you know, to had to find a coach too. So actually, I didn't make any signing before appointing the coach because uh, that for me was also a sign of respect for the coach himself, whatever coach I would have chosen. And then together with the coach, you know, we went through the list of the potential player, and um, we chose the one um, functional for us. Because at the end of the day, uh, imagine uh, the player acquisition as a puzzle, okay? You shouldn't get the piece of the puzzle that you like. You should find what you need, okay? Sometimes you have to bring in players that in another situation you won't take, but those players are the ones that make function the whole mechanism, you know? It's like, uh, imagine you have a Rolex and you have a Patek Philippe, okay? Two luxury watches. But if you dismantle those watches, you, you won't build a third luxury watches. Because every, every watch works with those components. So basically, 
Again, I was lucky to choose the coach. Together with him, we identify where we should uh, find players to improve and create, again, another word that you use, the balance. Because at the end of the day, it's important to create a balance. Even in, in top club, for example, in Saudi, you have to consider the balance. Because when you bring top players, the risk is that they won't match together, even if they are top players. So, you know, I think uh, finding this balance, uh, it's, it's the key. And uh, this is the starting point uh, to bring in a club uh, uh, functional players. Also because another point that you mentioned, in Saudi, everyone comes getting a netto salary, and is a big net salary. But when then you have to sell those players, things come hard. Because almost it, impossible. Yeah, if a player from Saudi got 4 million net, it would be almost 8 million uh, gross in Europe. And when we are required to find a solution for those players, it's, it's hard. Because uh, the clubs in Europe will tell, uh, guys, we don't have the money to pay the salary. Therefore, the selection <coughs> process is a crucial part. For example, I remember transferring Denier and now he's one of the best centre-backs. So how was that story? Yeah, well, the story was that um, I think in our job, uh, even if, uh, if you're not working uh, uh, in this moment in a club, you should keep <coughs> look an eye on the market constantly. Because this is the only way to remain updated and when you get a job, you are good to go. And uh, you have to diversify you know, the, the, the type of players you know, that you're going to put in your own files, because uh, if, if tomorrow, inshallah, I will go in a top uh, Saudi club, I know that I have to target certain players. But if I go to a medium-low club, you know, with different uh, target Completely goals... Completely different Yes. So, in, in the example you mentioned, Jason Denier is a player that I used to, to know before as a profile. And uh, I was just waiting to know for the Saudi Pro League how much money I had. So because if you don't know your budget, uh, it's like if you dry without having the coordinates of where you have to go. Once I know how much money I, I could uh, rely on, and then I was, it, it took uh, 10 days to identify, you know, uh, to narrow the circle and say, okay, those are the players I can aim for. Jason was free transfer, 28 years old, you know, with a great CV on the past, so... I told the, the, the board, I think this is the player we need to, to, to improve. Uh, and uh, mentioning the use of the data, it's, for me, is extremely important, you know, but uh, you have to contextualize the data use. Because sometimes, uh, for example, the last data of JSON weren't that amazing. But then you have to go one year back, two years back, you know, and, and, and try to envision if this player in a different environment, you know, would work because uh, sometimes you take a player that on the paper you know is a, is a talent and then you bring it uh, to your team and it, and it doesn't perform and in my opinion someone who is good cannot uh, you know forget how to play football <laughs> in a few months later I mean you're dealing with humans and the human behavior changes against the weather against the family condition against everything, yeah. the money, payments on time. So there are a lot of different uh, equations to form, and plus a different country. Yeah. So in one country, for example, a Nordic person comes to Saudi or Turkey or even uh, Cyprus, so very different dynamics. That, that part is crucial. For example, in the player acquisition, what I request to the club, for example, uh, to the media house or the marketing department, I ask them to prepare three different presentations. One, it's made for player and family, because they need to know where they're coming, you know, uh, if there are international school, hospital, uh, airport, because, you know, with the player, normally there is a family, there are kids, and uh, the player is looking to the financial part, you know, the sports project, but the wife doesn't care about that part, or, or, or better saying, is not the priority for the wife is, are there good school? Is there a kindergarten? You know, how is the health system? And so on. So I asked the club to prepare a presentation 
to pitch well, you know, the city, the club, in this way. Then there is the institutional uh, presentation, and then there is the marketing presentation. But that presentation helped the sport director to convince someone to come, in this case, in a city, Halasa, that was, uh, is not uh, Riyadh or Jeddah. I remember when I spoke to Slaven Bilic, he asked me, how is the city there? And my answer was, <laughs> well, Slaven, we have 2.5 million palms. <laughs> it's the biggest one. And he was laughing. He said, what, what are you going to do with the power <laughs> But uh, I had to find uh, you know, some value regarding uh, the place. Anyway, thank you, Nico. You're welcome we'll come back to you. Now, um, I will take all of you to another part of the world, which is Cyprus. But Laurent the show has a great experience coming from Nottingham Forest to France, various different clubs and uh, now in Omonia, mm -hmm. well, each of these places have different dynamics. And um, I would like to know personally now what changed, because from different dynamics, I'm talking about two major uh, powerhouses of football, then coming to down the south to Cyprus. So what changed actually in this player recruitment and scouting process? Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like first to put the focus on my experience on uh, the French market, because it's different than Saudi, for example. Um, I had the opportunity to stay four years as a sporting director in Grenoble, in Ligue 2, which is one of the best second league, uh, let's say, in, the, in Europe. Um, and the approach was totally different than uh, Saudi, Cyprus, uh, Turkey, Greece, that kind of countries. Um, you know, in France, we have the know-how and the knowledge to develop young players, especially in second league. Uh, this is the main target. Of course, I agree with my colleague. You never play the same style or you haven't got the same environment. Depending on the city, the club where you are, it's uh, again the same uh, analysis in the same league. You, you don't play the same uh, football style in Saint-Étienne, for example, than in Grenoble. But cities are very close. Uh, so you have to take care about the, the environment, the history of the club, and of course the strategy. But if I come back to Grenoble, um, the goal was to, um, to have balance between experienced players, but also young players with high potential to develop and to, to be able... Mix a mix, a combination, mm. in order to be able to sell these players to the other countries. Uh, we have the chance, for example, in France, to be scouted by many clubs from Germany, from Italy, from uh, England, uh, many clubs. Um, so the goal was to develop young players and to be able to sell them in the future. So that's maybe the difference with Saudi and uh, Turkey or Greece even Cyprus, because the expectations in those countries are to be performant at short term, to get results. And this Let's is, score tomorrow. Uh, yes, and it's another uh, approach, you know. So uh, it was very interesting for me to, again, to work in the League 2, because uh, maybe it was my best experience in my career. Uh, I had the opportunity to, um, to put the focus on youth development again, but not to take care so much about the financial aspect. Because when you try to convince a player to come in the second league in France, first, they want to know the project. They want to know what is the plan for the next step, because for them it's a step. Um, so you build, in a certain way, their career with them. It's like a um, combination. I give you an example. Uh, Florian Sotoka was in Grenoble five years ago. Uh, we sold him to Lens in 2019. And this season, he was playing in the Champions League group. Uh, he played against Arsenal. They won Arsenal at home. Uh, so, in a certain way, I was a part of his success bring him in, in Grenoble, develop him, his uh, skills, his abilities, and give him the chance to progress, to improve, and to be now in a top club in the Ligue 1. 
So that's the, um, the, the, the fact that we can uh, be proud uh, and finance is out of the picture in that case. So that's another approach, you see. Well, um, I'm also wondering because the, the Cypriot teams recently in the last five, six years, it's amazing successes. We are often actually seeing them in uh, UEFA competitions. Yeah. And uh, how did this actually develop for Cyprus? Okay, so what so, were their strategies? Because, I mean, uh, the passion in football, Greece, Turkey, Italy, Cyprus, almost the uh, same pressures, winning it tomorrow, yeah, you know, less yeah, yeah. patience from the management, a lot of changing coaches. However, I, personally, I can see this, uh, Cypriot uh, people adapted this and the team's progressing. Yeah, that's true. The last two, three years, uh, Cyprus market increased a lot in terms of uh, competition standard. Um, I think it's due to the financial investment from f foreign funds. Uh, you have a lot of uh, Russian, um, for example, in Pafos FC, Aris Limassol. Aris Limassol you worked in both clubs. Who played, yeah, and Aris played this season in the Europa League, uh, which was a fantastic uh, result for them and performance. Uh, last season, Aik Larnaca played a very good uh, competition in Conference League. They reached the quarter-final against West Ham. Um, but it's mainly due to the fact that many foreign investors take care about the clubs. They invest a lot of money. But for sure, it's the same approach than Turkey or Greece. They need short-term results. They invest on experienced players with high value. And they try to, um, to find the right chemistry with uh, young local talents. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's far from what we are doing in Spain or in France or in Belgium because it's totally different strategy. So we come back to the fact that the, first the strategy and your playing philosophy are the, the main points to, to build your team. Um, but Cyprus has good result and increased uh, the performance each season due to the investment. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Now, um, another colorful personality all the way from Brazil to Middle East Peninsula. And um, first, my first question is going to be the adaptation process um, from Brazil perspective to changing to another continent because right now um, uh, you being in the UEFA elite scouting program and um, this is the top educational level <coughs> and uh, learning process simply never ends so um, as we spoke with Nico, so Nico in Saudi and El Nasser, uh, I think it's a t two different ball games, because um, um, being in El Nasser, a lot more pressure, and as you know, the international transfers, etc., etc. So first, coming from Brazil to the peninsula, with all your knowings, all your experience, and meeting with this new culture, and integrating your knowledge plus the new educational system. So where are you from that point to, uh, to the current El Nasser project? Because it's a fairly interesting project all over the world, all the attention from the world. So let us know your fantastic voyage. Thank you, Arkan. Uh, good morning for everybody. Uh, I think all of us, we said one word here, that's context. This is uh, one of the most important words. If you work everywhere, get to know your context. So the Al Nasser context is one, Cyprus, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, same country, same league, different city. And I have been before in Al Faisal in Saudi, which is completely different uh, context, uh, even a smaller city than <coughs> Al-Hassa, for example. So we have to get this into account when selecting players and recruiting uh, talents to your club. You have to see what's the background of that player, 
Uh, for example, where I used to live before in Al Harma is a 5,000 city. Let's say I cannot even call it a city because it's like a village. And our president, once he wants to sign one guy, he played for Inter Milan. And he has three kids. He said, President, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. One guy that he was in Milan, his wife, he was in Milan. His kids, they will not come here. And they have been all the way together. So either they will be separated and his concentration will not be here. Either he will be fed up if he brings his family here. So I have been living abroad, as you mentioned. I'm, I left Brazil in 2001. So I already passed in Belgium, in Spain, in three different cities, in Kuwait, now in Saudi, two different cities. So I think the key is the willingness, first of all, to adapt. Because if you accept a challenge, at the end, you have to say, okay, why I accept this challenge? So I'm going there with a good mentality to understand that anywhere in the world, either in Brazil, in Europe, in Middle East, West Asia, USA, you have good things, you have bad things. You have depressed people that live in front of the sea, and you have happy people who live in the favelas in Brazil, and they barely have uh, water to drink. So it's not focus on the place, but focus on yourself. And okay, I have a mission. I have, a, I have something that I want to achieve. And if to achieve this goal, I have to pass somehow some difficulties. But if you have this willingness to adapt, things will be much easier. So the secret, if I, I have to summarize context, and uh, adaptation. You have to be very careful with these two things before taking any decision. Kind of studying where you are, what are the goals, and then you take decision. Um, Nico, um, well, obviously, we're talking about the secrets of player recruitment. How was your, uh, because coming from Italy, you being a player also in the MLS days and played in Germany, very different places. And with your experience in the last experience in Al Fateh, how was this data-driven approach that I know, how did you implement it, your ideas uh, to Al Fateh? And uh, how, did you, how were you able to speak the same data language in the club? Uh, <clears throat> yes, that's a good question because uh, when you have to interact uh, with, uh, with the decision maker, you know, in the club, so the, the board or the president, depend who is the one that gives uh, the final words, you have to try to let him understand <coughs> your ideas. So why you would like to bring this player and not that player. Okay? So as I said before, for one particular player that at the end I brought uh, to Al Fateh, Jason Denier, the data itself, you know, of the previous year were not that amazing. But if you knew the profile, you know, from the past, then you can challenging your board and the president say, guys, I think this, this is what we need, you know? And uh, for example, when some data doesn't help you, even though they reflect the reality of the, of the previous year, then you have to uh, call your network. For example, I, without hiding anything, I make a couple of phone calls, put the loudspeaker with sporting director where this guy was previously. Coaches who coached these guys previously, you know. Uh, Belgian national team um, medical department because they wanted to be sure that they didn't, uh, you know, had uh, bad injuries. So also, those are data. If it's information, are data, okay? So data are not just uh, the numbers, okay? Data can be hidden story about the player. Uh, for example, nowadays everyone is in the social media and also a, an information and a tip for the ladies of the, of the team that are present here today. Take care about your social page because uh, clubs are looking at that, you know. Social page speak about you. Uh, I remember I had a meeting with Manchester United in the past about two big players, you know. Um, 
I cannot disclose the name, but two different profiles and the social media were clearly showing that those players, both grades, were totally different. So those information are important. There are clubs that hire psychologists to analyze the social pages. So uh, back to your question. I try to, you know, that's also depend on the level of the person you're talking to in terms of knowledge. If uh, your president or the board doesn't have a certain knowledge, I cannot bring to them graphics that they will not understand. I have to summarize the information. Therefore, it is important for me while organizing a club to have uh, each person in his own role capable to bring you the information needed to be reported to the, to the final person that has to listen to the information. Because, for example, a data analyst, if he talks directly to the president or the, the board, sometimes uh, will create a confusion because he has elements that those people cannot understand. So either you instruct the data analyst how to speak to the main management or you create a communication with the data analyst and together with him you create the way to communicate uh, to the main management. And this is the way how you can explain better your idea. And I think uh, also ideas need to be explained because this is what um, gives you the strength as, as executive um, to, to explain why you choose one player. Of course, you have to take the, your responsibility because we don't have the magic ball. So sometimes uh, you bring player again that uh, will not work as expected. But this is why our role is much more than just uh, watch a game and, uh, and look to the data. Uh, when you have to bring a player, you have to see the whole contest. Marcelo before mentioned something very important. If you bring a player, the family is not there. Or if you bring a player like the other player I brought to Alaza, he had, a, he had a special needs due to his, his family situation, and they need to consider that. So my, my first priority became to fix that problem even before he ended up to the club. Because I remember the first match he played, just to give you a, a visual image for that, he came into the pitch, and the first things he did, he was watching on the stand to see if his family was there. He was not thinking about, actually, it was the match uh, against yes, us. You know? So, when I saw him, I was like, hey, wait a minute, why he is he looking in the stands and until he doesn't see and find the family, he's not ready to play. Wow, guys, this is something important. So, that part must be fixed as soon as possible. Then the player is, is ready to go. Great, Nico. Um, now, my uh, second question to Jayhun. Well, it's a, a common problem anyway. Um, sports directors or chief scouts receive offers from agencies. Presidents receive or board members receive offers. And coach receives offers. Assistant coach receives offers. And the combination of all is a big, huge, massive difficulty, especially in the Turkish League, right? So how did you manage this coordination at the time of Besiktas? Well, is this I, such a difficult... Sure, it is. It, of course, it depends on the club, but I was a bit lucky about this. Because I was the only uh, contact point for all the agents. Even if an agent makes an offer to the president or to the coach or to the assistant coach, etc., they were all sending me all the offers, and I was the only one, or my team was the only contact people uh, speaking with the agents. So I was a bit lucky. But you are right, in, especially uh, in other clubs in Turkey, I hear and I really know about this, uh, most of the presidents, they try to make the deals directly. They don't have any idea about the, about the market, about the quality of the player. But at the end of the day, as Nico said, first of all, you need to convince the president, the decision maker, about your ideas. Once he is convinced that you are the guy who will make this deal in a proper way, then he will also orient you all the, all the offers coming to him. So, as I said, I was a bit lucky in Besiktas about this, because the president had 
full confidence on me, and uh, he was always giving my contact details to every single agent trying to make the deal through him. Even if sometimes, of course, agents cannot find the solution with you, so they go directly to the decision maker. So this is, this is a, the way that we all experienced, I'm sure. But I was lucky, as I said, I mean, he was always telling, no, Jayun is the guy, so you have to do this through him. So that helped me a lot. So I could put my ideas on every single deal easily. And as I said, harmony with the coach is the most important thing. So how did you deal with the coach? Because sometimes the, the president, scouting team, sports director always agreeing one thing, but the coach is speaking another language. Yeah, sure. Uh, very important that he is convinced because at the end of the day, he will let him play. And he uh, can be fully convinced about the player, but if the coach says no, I never signed this player, to be honest, because he will not let him play. And at the end of the day, you are the responsible guy, and all the fans will blame you, or even president will blame you. And once they start not to play, then the player will also lose his confidence, etc. And uh, it will reflect on ideal. you in the end. Yeah, it's not the ideal situation actually. But before you need to have an agreement with the coach about the needs first, about the positions, then about the. Uh, styles of the players that you are looking for. Okay, you might be looking for a number nine, but there are different types of number nines. So you need to, first of all, get an agreement with the, with the coach about, about all the details. Afterwards, of course, it's your job to deal with the budget, with the salaries, everything. Uh, for, for example, when we signed many players uh, from Premier League two years ago, my idea was that, my observation was that in Turkish League, Intensity is lacking, actually. Not, the league is not as intense as Europe, top five leagues. So in order to compete with European teams, first of all, we need to increase the level of the intensity on the pitch. That's why we signed many players from Premier League. But that was also the idea of the coach. So we had total agreement with him. Afterwards, uh, it was really easy for me to close the deals, everything, because he was also helping me while convincing the players, by the way. This is also a very important point. If you don't have an agreement with the coach, you will not have a meeting altogether, but sometimes, okay, the player asks some questions about life, about salary, everything, but about the plans of the coach also, I'm sure he has some, ideas, some questions. And uh, if the coach explains him, about all the details on the pitch, about how he will use him as a key player, then easily you can convince the player. So, total harmony is the, is the key point, I guess. The decision makers, coach, sporting directors, they, they all have to be on the same page so that you can create a good story. That's Wonderful. the key point. Now, I'll come back to Laurent because um, I still want to explore uh, because England to France to Cyprus. So, for example, as a chief scout or a sports director, how was the this harmony established in France versus Cyprus? Because uh, Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, more of a president, you know, the last decision mm -hmm. even before the court. So, how is it like in France to Cyprus? Yeah, it's different. Uh, again, it's uh, different, I think, of culture. Um, in France, um, the sporting director takes the responsibility to define the sports policy, to define also a process, how to work, how to build your scouting department, how to build the team, what kind of playing philosophy you are going to set up with your coach. Um, and the president never interferes, really. Um, you take the responsibility and you are judged at the end of the, the season. If you have results, everything is perfect. When you go to countries like Greece, because I was also in Aris Thessaloniki, and it was a fantastic example, uh, I like a lot uh, President Karipidis, but he's typically the president who wants to make the team to take care about the marketing, take care about the business, 
to be sometimes the coach, to sit on the bench in the game. So you have to, to, to adapt yourself to that kind of environment, but for sure it's totally different than uh, France. Uh, it's uh, another culture, another planet <laughs> even. <laughs> um, and yes, uh, I think we come back again to the same uh, context. That means, for example, in Spain, in France, in Belgium, you have time to, to develop a project generally for two, three seasons, so we are on a medium-term uh, goal. Uh, in those countries, Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, I think so, um, you need to have short results, and the president uh, wants to show to, also to the fans, to the environment, that uh, the project is strong, they are able to win fast, to get a strong performance, so you see it's a totally different approach. Um, and we have to adapt ourselves uh, as a chief scout or sporting director to that kind of environment. And uh, as said Marcelo, our job is to be adaptable. And uh, when you have success in different countries, that means you are capable to, to be flexible and to, to manage different uh, culture, approach, and also uh, ego, because there is a part of ego to manage. Now, um, Marcelo, um, as you know, Saudi League, I mean, this is my personal opinion, achieved a fantastic job, my opinion, bringing all those players um, very famous, uh, but the fame also brings other handicaps. So many famous uh, players in one team, you recruited, the recruitment process is by itself to convince the player, um, give them the opportunities from their children's schools to the city, to the apartment. Um, how did it all happen, for example, in El Nasser? Because you're the team executive, I believe, that your relationship with these individual players are such important to reflect on the performance, right? So how was your obstacles or advantages in this fame of the players? I think uh, the, the perception that the world of football has towards uh, Saudi Arabia, once uh, there was the big move in January, beginning of the year, General Ronaldo decided to join our club, changed the perception of, okay, if... This guy, he's living there, his family is living there, his kids, they are studying there. It means, and he's showing everywhere that he's happy. So, it's, it's not one person work, it's a, it's a teamwork. So, and then, uh, Nico, he said very well, sometimes it's not who you like, but it's the, who you need to make the puzzle. And it's very complex, because you are talking about human beings. So you're talking about human beings, you're talking about 30 uh, young guys, you're talking about one foreign staff, you're talking about local staff, you're talking about presidency, you're talking about now the PIF who bought our club and they come with a lot of governance, uh, which is good for the football, but create some attracts, some clashes at the beginning. So again, I come back to adaptability and to be smart, to understand your context and small talks with everybody because sometimes you have to treat the team as if you are a coach, you treat your team. Everybody has his own task. But it has to be clear for everybody. Okay, Marcelo, what is your role? Is it clear for you? Yes. Okay, the, the kit man. So now you have these stars, but this is not the behavior that you're expecting from you. So they have their... We, we, we are in another level. So it requires people to adapt and realize that, okay, it's not like this used to be. And it was already professional. I'm not saying that before it was zero and now... No, no. Saudi, there was Saudi football... Long, long time, as we spoke yesterday, the Saudi football, is, there is the passion, there is the professionalism. There are big players since 
long time ago come into play there. Now it's a different level. So we have to be smart to understand that from now onwards things will work differently and make everybody understand the message. And when you see that, okay, old behaviors teach because this is build a new culture, build new behaviors that will lead at the end to, to maintain the level of uh, professionalism that, as you said, the, the, the Saudi football achieved today and keep growing because it will not stop now, uh, of course, I think it will be difficult to have another transfer window as impactful as it was in last uh, summer. But uh, now, as I say, the gate is open. Now we have players from uh, La Liga, they're willing to come. They have players from uh, Premier League, they're willing to come. They have players from Bundesliga, they are willing to come. So now, it's like broke a, a barrier. Also, it gives you worldwide because uh, before my previous experience with El Faisali for some leagues we don't we don't target that those leagues because I know it's difficult to approach one guy from Arsenal from Manchester City yeah, come to play in Saudi Arabia it would be difficult but now this barrier is broken oh how many players from Liverpool that are playing now in Saudi you have Fabinho you have uh, Sadio Mane you have many of, of players and for the future, now it's, it's open, but in both ways. It means a player that Gabri Vega, for example, he came to, to, to Al-Ahli, it's a young guy, and everybody was surprised. I don't think Gabri Vega, he will end his career in, in Saudi. It means there is a, a movement back. And then it's a challenge, as uh, Nico said at the beginning, and I'm there since 2018, and it's really difficult when you sign somebody and it doesn't fit, to find another place to him. He will lose money. Because as everybody knows that the salaries and no tax makes that uh, the, it's almost impossible uh, to find the solution if so. It means you have to be a little bit more uh, concerned about it to minimize really the, the possibility. But again, we are talking about human beings and we are not uh, magicians that will choose. Things happen wrong and in my opinion, as soon as you identify what is the mistake, solve it. And then you keep growing and you keep adjusting the team to, to give what you want for them, which is a good performance. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, again, uh, I would like to thank you for coming from all around the world in far places. Firstly, again, I'd like to thank to 1207 Antalya team and Antalya Denis Spor. Uh, welcome to our event and hopefully you all uh, liked what we said. And we would again like to thank Behich Kaya and Ihan to make this fantastic event. But claps for the women and all together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Darkan. Darkan, sorry. May I add something uh, at the yes, end? Because we please. have the opportunity to have a young player today with us. Uh, because we are talking about secrets, you know. So maybe they want to know what does it take to go to the next level, you know. What does it take to be picked, scouted. And um, I think that while executive, you know, need to adapt to the club uh, we are going to war for, they should do the opposite. In which way? They should not adapt, you know? Because uh, you girls, in this case, you have to train not uh, according to the club or the league where you are playing today. You have to train according to the club where you aim to end up to, okay? So if your dream is to become a pro player and end up to play in a big team, all you think about that when you go on the training fields. Because when we are going to scout players, sometimes, or every time actually, we don't see when it comes about young players. We don't look at what uh, the player is now. We are looking about the potential. We are looking about how this player can adapt if he goes on a higher level. And this is something very important. Because sometimes you, you are good in that club and in that league. 
But the people that come to evaluate you has to evaluate your coachability. It means if you can be a player that a top coach can train to improve you more, you know. So keep in mind that when you go on the training field. Because this is a little secret you know, that we can reveal to you as an executive, as, as a people that scout players around the world, that uh, it's, it's very important. A player that can show that would have much more chance to be choose than others that are just good in that particular moment. Thank you for that. And Thank you for all coming. And uh, we won't take questions in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, you. our next, you. we Thank took the photos before, uh -huh. or will we will take it again so. because we still have time. <coughs> Can you remove the photo? Yeah, take it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Laurent Deschaux, Marcel Salazar, Jehun Kazancı, Nicole Inocentin, and Tarkan Batgun. Please join us in 15 minutes for our next panel. Let's have some coffee and let's have some chat all together. Genç futbolcu arkadaşlarımı da burada insanlarla tanışmaya, sohbet etmeye davet ediyorum. Sizler de lütfen kahve arasında bizlerle bol bol sohbet edin. See you in 15 minutes.